All right, here we go, guys. Uh, this one for section four, we're going to be talking about upheavals in China. So we learned back in chapter 24 that the last ruling dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty, collapsed in 1911. And a Chinese republic was formed right after that. Well, this republic was experiencing some problems. Uh, let's first talk about the kind of the father of the Chinese Republic, a very important figure in 20th century Chinese history, and that's Sun Yixian. Uh, Sun was the first president of the New Republic. He hoped to rebuild China on the three principles of the people. And we talked about this back in chapter 24. Nationalism, democracy, and socialism. Or really with socialism, it, a better word that you have for that really was more government for the people. Okay, uh, kind of working for the people, not necessarily for themselves. However, chaos erupted after he stepped down. He voluntarily stepped down, kind of following the example of, you know, George Washington from American history. But after he stepped down, his successor really wasn't able to keep everything together the way that uh, Sun did. His successor really just wanted to start a new dynasty. Uh, but his the successor's problem was he wasn't supported by the military. So this divided the nation and almost kind of turned it into civil war. And making things worse, in the local provinces, warlords fought for control. Now, there was no centralized government, or at least no strong centralized government, to keep the local warlords in order. You can see this map here. And just move me down and erase the pen. By 1923, how you've got Western warlords, you've got Southern warlords, you know, it's really looking almost kind of like it's a feudal government. You know, it's going back to the days of feudalism as opposed to the 20th century. Uh, and this chaos caused suffering for millions of peasants. There was no centralized government to protect them. Now, sensing China's weakness, foreign influence increased during this time. And you can see that from the map as well. You can see how this region, this blue shader region, uh, that was, I guess, the only equivalent of a centralized government. You see down here, U.S. British support. You can see how the Japanese were involved up here. Soviet support down here. British support over here. Um, it wasn't just the Western nations uh, that were involved in this. You know, I, uh, up here I circled how the Japanese were getting involved. Remember, by the early 1900s, Japan was an emerging, um, modernized, and westernizing as well uh, world power. Uh, and so Japan, looking at the weakness of the Chinese, issued the 21 demands. Now, these were issued by Japan to the Chinese uh, really right after World War I, like at the Paris Peace Conference. And according to the 21 demands, it would make China a Japanese protectorate. Um, China was too weak to withstand the new modern Japanese military, and so it gave in to some of the demands, not all of them, but still, just giving in to some of them, it was very, very embarrassing. It was an outward display of weakness to the Japanese, and this infuriated Chinese nationalists. you got to remember, China had been a superpower in Asia for centuries, Okay, going back to ancient times. And thus, they viewed other nations like Japan and Korea as being inferior. The fact that one of these inferior nations was now dictating terms to them made nationalists absolutely uh, crazy angry. Now, in response to this, you have the May 4th movement. It began as student protests. Uh, the primary goal of the protesters was to strengthen China. You know, they wanted to uh, build up China back to the glory days of what it used to be. And they figured the primary way to do this was reject foreign influence, not only from the West, but also from Japan. Now, many participants in this movement were influenced by the work of Marx and Lenin. Now, you remember Karl Marx, the guy with the beard, and Vladimir Lenin, the guy completely bald. Uh, they were, uh, well, Marx was kind of like the father of communism, you know, and Lenin was the guy who created a communist government in the Soviet Union. So what are we going to see? We're going to see the emergence of communism in China right now. You're going to see, you know, the Soviet Union, the hammer and sickle, really start to emerge as an influence over here for the red wave that is going to eventually uh, take hold in China. But before communism could establish itself as being the dominant dominant ideology, you're going to have a struggle for China. In order to reassert control, okay, Sun Yishan comes back, he comes out of retirement, and he establishes the Guomindang or the Nationalist Party. Now, in order to promote unity, Sun initially worked with Chinese communists who were emerging uh, after the May 4th movement. This changed, however, after Sun died, and the Guomindang was taken over by a charismatic young general known as Zhang Jiexi. Uh, you'll also hear him referred to in the West as Chiang Kai-shek. 
uh, Zhang didn't really care for either democracy or communism. He just wanted control for himself. He was successful in defeating a lot of the warlords, though, but after he did that, Zhang turned on the communists. Uh, he saw them as a threat to his power. Now, when Guomindang forces slaughtered Communist Party members and, supported, uh, and supporters, it started a long, bitter civil war between the Guomindang nationalists and communists. Remember, Guomindang and nationalists, they're the same people. Okay, same thing. So when I go back and forth and refer to them as Guomindang or nationalists, I'm talking about the same guys. The communists were led by this gentleman, Mao Zedong, going to be a very, very important figure in 20th century China. Now, Mao worked to, uh, tirelessly to win the, so obviously he was a communist leader, and he worked to win the support of the peasants. He was a little different from a lot of other communist leaders. Uh, unlike Lenin, who was talking about the proletariat and the working class, Mao didn't really look to the factories. He looked to the farms in order to gain support. He said the peasantry is the backbone of China. It's been that way for centuries. He goes, if I can win their support, I'll win this whole thing. But it wasn't going to be easy. Zhang was determined to destroy Mao and his followers. And he personally led, Zhang personally led the Nationalist Army in chasing the communists in what became known as the Long March. The Long March, which lasted from 1934 to 1935, was a strategic retreat of Mao and the communists over 6,000 miles. Okay, you see the route of the march, how uh, started down here in southeastern China, worked its way, you know, through the snow, uh, the mountains and so forth. And this was an arduous journey. You know, here's a picture of Mao. That's him in the middle there on horseback and his followers. Many times they were just a ragged group, okay, kind of, you know, uh, basically depending on the kindness of the locals in order to support them. But they were successful in resisting the Guamindang. And they did this through two main tactics. One, they utilized guerrilla tactics, right? That's what you do if you've got some home field advantage. They were supported by the locals and uh, they were outnumbered. So that's what you do. And as I just said, they won the support of the peasants. You know, Mao gave very strict orders to his followers to treat the peasants kindly and to not loot or steal anything. And because of this, among the peasantry, Mao became a somewhat heroic figure while Zhang was looked at as being the bad guy. Now, while the Long March was going on, though, China faced another danger, this one from the outside when the Japanese invaded. Now, we'll talk more about this in the next section, but in 1931, Japan invaded the region of Manchuria in northeastern China. This was viewed as an illegal intrusion, but it didn't stop the fighting between the nationalists and the communists at the time, right? We said that the Long March would continue into 1934 and 35. What eventually brought both sides together was in 1937, Japan overran eastern China, right? So here's Manchuria. You also notice how they conquered the Korean Peninsula. But by 1937, they really started to make their way in here into the Chinese heartland. Um, and what this started what became known as the Second Sino-Japanese War. And a lot of historians believe that this should actually be considered the true start of World War II. Uh, the Japanese bombed Chinese cities. They overran major Chinese cities such as Beijing is in there. They also conquered uh, Guangzhou and Hong Kong. You can see down in here some incursions that they had. But this area in here, okay, the Yangtze River Valley, they made sure that they conquered that entire area. And the Japanese were brutal in their invasion, most notoriously during a period known as the Rape of Nanjing. Now, Nanjing was an important historical city for the Chinese and was the capital, actually, of the Guomindang government. After the city surrendered, Japanese troops massacred and brutalized both soldiers and civilians. Um, exact numbers of casualties are difficult to determine, but historians think as many as 200,000 people were killed. A lot of the atrocities were really so horrible that, you know, a lot, you know, I try and do image searches to include on this to give you a real visual connection of this. I chose not to because they're very difficult to watch. They're disturbing. You know, you can look it up on your own, uh, but it really shows the low, uh, you know, what the low point of what mankind is capable of, the barbarity of it. Uh, it's still a sore point in Chinese Japanese relations to this day. But this foreign invasion, it did unite the nationalists and the communists, right? Here's Mao and here's Zhang. Uh, because it united them against a common enemy, right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And uh, would eventually join forces with the Allies once World War II became a global war. We'll um, 
now, but as we'll discuss in a later chapter, that alliance wouldn't be, uh, would not last long. All right, so that wraps things up for China, and then we'll talk about Japan in the next one.